Thanks, guys. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, turn with me to John chapter 16. We're going to look at one verse today in verse number 33, and we're going to do it kind of in a conversational style here with Shelton and I. I do have my cell phone on me, and so if you have questions specifically about the book of John, I'd prefer, but if you have relevant questions uh, about what we're talking about, you can be more than welcome to text in. Uh, We'll get to some of them. We won't get to others of them. Some of them we won't be able to know how to answer. And somebody texted in the first service, why don't you take literally when Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, I'll give to you. And I said, I don't know. Uh, let me get back with you. And so uh, some of those things will, will go in that way. So my phone number is 479-462-7403. And so if you want to text those, in those questions, you're more than welcome to. That's 479 462 uh, 7403. And so throughout today's uh, message. So it's good to be here with Shelton, our former student pastor. Now, uh, Pastor of Discipleship, how do, how do you feel about that? Uh, bittersweet. I'm, I'm awfully excited about what and feel very much called to step into this role of, of Discipleship Pastor, and I'm thankful for the opportunity from you and the, the directors to be able to do that. And I think it's a, it's a, a role in our church that, that can have rippling effects uh, through, throughout the years as we really look at growth and personal discipleship and, and how that uh, works. So I'm so excited to step into that. But at the same time, I love teenagers, and I've always loved teenagers, and they will always have a special place in my heart. I think the teen years, all of you can probably remember very specific thing about your, things about your teenage years. Um, it's just those years stand out, and they're so formative, and uh, have had the privilege for the last six years to to walk with teenagers through uh, through those formative years and uh, really begin to solidify the the faith development, of, I, it has been a blast. Um, and so there'll be times coming up when Chris, a new youth pastor, who steps in, and I'll be seeing the photos of them gallivanting all over or doing events, and I'll wish I would have been there with them. And then I'll go to bed at night in my own bed, and then be thankful that he's here. So, uh, so bittersweet is what yeah, I would say. Absolutely. Well, you know what I look forward to the most. They're going to they're gonna stop asking, hey, when's Shelton going to leave? Because <laughs> I, I got that a thousand. What are you going to do to keep Shelton? How are you going to keep Shelton? This is what we're doing to keep Shelton. And so we're very, <laughs> very happy about that. I'm so thinking. in part, what we're going to do today, I mean, discipleship in part, preaching is a central aspect of that. It can't be the only aspect. And yet uh, part of what God has called us to do and how, we're, how he transforms our heart is through the concept of preaching. And so if you don't gather on a weekly basis and hear godly-based preaching, uh, then you're not going to become a disciple, a follower of Jesus. But at the same time, if this is all you get, uh, that's not enough uh, either. And so it is this dual process of what's going on. And so in part, what we're going to do today is give you a little bit of a glimpse of what happens in our own personal private Bible study, what happens on Tuesday morning, uh, except then there's eight people around the table, not just two, uh, as we look at a text and how we go about studying it. And so our hope is that we get a, a better grasp of who God reveals himself to be here in John chapter 16, that you walk away empowered by this verse of what's taking place. We also hope you pick up some skills that you can transfer into your own personal Bible study uh, and, and go from there. So Shelton, I, I'm going to read the verse here, and coming out of that, I just want you to pick up whenever you first look at this verse. Uh, where does your mind go? And, and then we can start running it from there. So uh, chapter 16, I'm just going to read verse 33. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. I, those last four, or last five words of that, of that verse, if you're an underliner in Scripture, I would underline that. I have overcome the world. Are there any more, five more powerful words to us than that? And what's fascinating about that is he's, he's speaking those words before the cross. So he already knows what's happening. And so we're reading this after the cross. So we're saying, oh, he's overcome the world because he went to the cross. But he spoke that in confidence of knowing the power of God. And he's saying, man, it's already won. <laughs> I'm looking this in the face. It's already won. I have overcome the world. And for, for us to hear the confidence of Christ say that, of take heart, I, I have overcome the world. To me, uh, this verse jumps off the page of that, that level of confidence that we as his disciples now get to walk through life for. I, I think about several years ago, um, my mom called, and I've got a special relationship with my mom, single mom, uh, through my teenage years, and um, with this close bond, and she, she called and said, Shelton, I've been diagnosed with a pretty advanced stage uh, breast cancer. Uh, which are never words that you want to hear from your mama. Uh, and she was young. She's in her 50s um, when, when that call came in. And, um, and she said, I've got to have surgery this week. And, and so 
Um, I immediately start making plans to drive down there to be there for the surgery. And I remember the whole way down to Dallas, um, really having that conversation all of y'all have probably had with God where you're going, what's going on, God? Why, why her? Why now? What, what is go- She's too good for this. What's happening? And, you know, all my theology goes out the window, and I'm, I'm just wrestling with God in that moment. And, and then I get to the hospital, and, and I'm walking into pre-op, and um, I'm all right, kind of giving myself that pep talk. All right, give it together. I've been in countless hospital rooms with people before that, and said she needs to feel strength from me in this moment, and open up the little curtain, and they let me in, and, and then I see my mama laid up in that bed with all the things attached to her, and I just lose it, and all my strength is gone, and suddenly I stop being Shelton the preacher, and I'm Shelton the emotional little kid again, and you're seeing mom, and, um, and then my mom, true to form, always the strong one in our family, begins to comfort me before they wheel her back for surgery, and she, she's saying, Shelton, it's okay, God's got this, whatever happens, God's got me, and she, it's just has been her approach to struggles, and then she does something that has never been done for me as the pastor in the room. She said, can I pray with you? <laughs> so she's going, so I'm there to pray with her. She said, can I pray with you? And she does, and we pray, and, and, uh, and then she goes back, and she just had this aura of peace about her as they wheeled her back. And I've thought about that, and I have seen that same aura of peace in some of your hospital rooms when I've gone to visit here. I experienced that same aura of peace when sitting with Christians in, in Haiti and just this horrific, horrific circumstances, and they're, they still have this peace. And, and what gives a Christian the right and the audacity to look something that huge in the face and have peace and, and calmness in the midst of it, not doing away with their fear, but having a real peace and things, thinking, and this is it. I mean, this is why, as Christians, we get to be audacious in our hope, because he has overcome the world. He's won, and yeah. I just love that. Yeah, and <clears throat> notice one thing. This would be a very common verse that would be in a devotional Bible study, or maybe, you know, you just open up the Bible and you come right here. It would be very common for you to land in John chapter 16, verse number 33. It's a great verse, a great memory verse. It's a verse, a life verse that you can take with you. Uh, but notice something very carefully here. It's very tempting whenever we open up a devotional and read this verse to read the verse and say, all right, how can I take heart or how can I have peace and to focus and to fixate on what is it that I need to do? But notice what Shelton just did here. He just did a very good form of Bible study, and that is you don't start with yourself, you start with Christ. You start with a question of what has God already done? What has he already accomplished for me? What has he already given to me? Now, it doesn't take away the idea that we have to look at what are our actions. But our actions are always in response to what God has already done for us. And so anytime, no matter what you're feeling emotionally, no matter where you are, anytime you pick up God's word, your first question needs to be, what has God already done? Living on this side of the cross, what has God already done for us? And you run into that. And then from that, you begin to understand what goes from that. And, and so in, in the application, the action steps of this passage, what God is going to tell us to do here is going to be very important. The what is going to be very important. But he's already given us the why. The why is because he's overcome the world. So the reason that we can do what it is that he's calling us to do, the reason that we have that ability, the reason that we should now have that encouragement, that direction, the reason that we can believe in that is because of what he has already done for us. In so many ways, we, we get messed up, we, we rob ourselves of the hope that we can possibly have because we put all of our energies and our focus on what should we do and not on what God has already done for us. I'm playing around, kind of tinkering with where we're going to go next, you know, whenever we finish John in a year. But I'm looking at what, where we're going next, and one of the things that we're looking at is a series on God's will. Well, so often what we get wrong there is whenever we think, what is God's will for my life? And we think to ourselves, what is it that he wants me to do? We forget what he's already done for us. And so if you start there, then the actions flow from that instead of reversing that order. So let's get there. That's, that's the why. Because he's overcome the world is the reason that now he calls us to do these things. Let's look at the beginning of the verse. I have said these things to you. Now, automatically, we begin to ask, what are these things? Is this everything Jesus has ever talked about? Probably not. Chances are, whenever we hear these things, we have two options. It can either primarily be the immediate context, and so just the verses right before this, or this section of Scripture. And so most likely for us, we can think about it both ways. These things is what he immediately just said, and then also it goes all the way back to 13.1. Which of those two? You can take either one. Take either one. We'll go the larger context. You okay. take the immediate context. All right, so let's go immediate context. These things. 
So all the, all the, the, the previous things that we've studied the last few weeks have taken place. Jesus then looks at his disciples and says, I've been talking to you in figurative language, but a time is going to come in which I'm going to speak very plainly to you. And, and in, that, in that moment, you're going to be able to grasp it. At that point, the disciples go, oh, oh, well, now we get it. To which Jesus says, which is one reason you should have your Bible whenever we preach, because you can look at verse number 31. Jesus says, do you now believe? You now believe. I changed water into wine. I healed a son, a nobleman's son, from a distance. I, I walked on water. I sped 5,000. I fed 5,000 with a, with a sack lunch. I raised Lazarus out of the grave. And now you believe? And so you almost have this sarcastic Jesus going, really? Now you believe. And, and what he goes on to, to basically say is, hey, all you guys are about to leave me. All of you. The faith that you have is not strong enough to go where I'm about to go. And yet, I'm revealing that to you not to condemn you, not to guilt you. I'm revealing that to you in part because I want you to take heart. Whenever you remember these words, on the, he knows, on the other side of the resurrection, when you, when you think I've given up on you, whenever you see how I have overcome the world, I want you to be able to have peace and know what I've done for you. And so I've said these things, these things in part being your sin, I've said these things so that you might have peace. But then the these things goes broader than that. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and just good Bible study skills, by the way, uh, we kind of just jumped right into this, but this is like Kevin said, one of those standalone verses that can be so powerful and you might have devotion. But anytime you're doing that in Scripture, and a lot of you are in our discipleship groups, going to be starting to read a lot of Scripture, notice what he, we're immediately doing is asking what's context, what's going on around this, because that brings so many elements to life uh, in this. So the immediate context there, but you zoom back even farther. And this is why a study Bible is fantastic. If you had a study Bible, ESV study Bible, which we all use as a staff, you can jump down and look at, at where it talks about verse 33, and it tells you this is the very end of a dialogue that began in chapter 13, verse 31. And this is, and if you walk through, you go all the way back and you start seeing things right away. It started with Jesus washing the disciples' feet. So a huge part of overcoming the world, of taking heart, has to do with serving others. Like that's just an element of, of it. And, and so, and you can see why, that, that if you don't have a heart of serving others and thinking about others' troubles, then life can, can make us be so self-centered, always see our own troubles. And so it's a huge part of serving others. You see that? You keep on going through. You see that Jesus talks about Judas betraying him and what's coming there. And, and so a, a large part of the troubles that are going to be in this world or even troubles for Jesus that, that friends let us down. They betray us. They hurt us. Broken relationships. You see Jesus given the, the elements of, 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 the, of the Lord's Supper and, and uh, of the Last Supper and talking about his own sacrifice. So obviously overcoming the world has to do with that. So all these things um, are all, all tied back to what he's been teaching. And then you get into verse 14 and the Holy Spirit and verse 15 and abiding in him. And all of these things are connected that he's able to now end the entire conversation. This is his last sentence before in 17, having this long Kevin-esque prayer of praying for 50 minutes. And it's Jesus-like. It, is that what it is? I'm just Kevin saying, is Jesus, Jesus prayed for a long time, so if you want to be like Jesus. When they write one of your prayers down and keep it for years and decades and <laughs> centuries and millennia. Um, <laughs> But, but so the, 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 the context there that he's, he's able to talk about these things that he's been teaching. And so you, we go back in our own mind, and if you haven't been with us, you kind of get the picture that Jesus has been teaching on major parts. This is his farewell goodbye in ways uh, before he goes and endures the cross. So he tells him, hey, these things I've told you so that in me you can have, you can have peace. Yeah, that, that's, I think that's what becomes fascinating. So let's go with peace, and then we'll get back to how we get that peace. So he says, I've said these things, and part of these things is I've, rev- I've outed Judas to you. Peter, I've told you about your own failure. Now to all the disciples, I've told all of you you're going to leave me. I've said this so that you might have peace. It sounds so contradictory, yeah. right? Because here's the thing. If, if I ever tell you that you're going to fail me, I've said that so that you may have guilt, right? That you might feel bad because how dare you fail me? But Jesus doesn't work like that. Jesus now, even in the midst of our failure, is trying to, he's being compassionate and gracious and kind and revealing to us, after you experience the turmoil of this failure, I want you to remember these things that you might have peace. 
So let's talk about what does peace look like. Whenever you, whenever you read this here, it, it's something we've already heard before, uh, even in this section of Scripture. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a repetition that takes place. An interesting thing that's ha- taking place here with the word peace is, you think about it, at the end of 16, so this is, this is the closing words that he says to his disciples. Then in 17.1, he lifts his eyes to heaven, he prays for a chapter, and then in 18, he gets arrested. So these, these are the last words that you may have peace because he's overcome the world. In that culture, the way you would greet one another is, is, was not hello, goodbye. It was peace. I mean, in much the same way that, you know, we kind of do peace out, you know? I mean, that's how you do it, right? Uh, that's how y'all say, that's why I was never a student pastor. Yeah, Did you see that right there? <laughs> but it's still the same, it's the same concept. I'm not making it up. Yeah, go ahead, okay. run with it. And so, yeah, nice haircut. And so, okay, so... Do you want to go there? So, no, that, I don't want to go there. Hey, I, <laughs> <laughs> At least you have hair. Mine's disappearing, right? Okay, so, hey, shouldn't we just make fun of Ed? Shouldn't we make fun of Ed together on no. that? Okay. So, so they, would, they, would, they would greet you with shalom. They would greet you with peace. And as you would exit, it would be with peace. And it was just, it was a prayer of hope. I can't give you peace, but I hope you have peace, right? May the Lord's peace be upon you. It's a, it's a prayer. It's a hope. Jesus here is saying goodbye to his disciples, and they don't even realize it. He's told him that. And so he closes here with a word of peace that would be a very common exit kind of word, and they don't even recognize it. And yet the peace that he is praying for them is not a, hey, I hope y'all can find peace. Instead, it goes all the way back to 14, where, where Jesus himself now says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives to you. Let your hearts not be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And so what Jesus is saying here is, this is a peace that I'm going to accomplish for you. It's not something that I hope you can find, or I hope you might have, or I hope the the fates of life cast upon you by the circumstances of your own situation. It is, you now can have this peace. But how do we have it? Yeah, my mind, my mind runs to Philippians 4. It talks about a peace that surpasses understanding, right? So, so we would love to, be, to get into this mindset of my peace comes when my problems leave, which is not at all what Jesus is talking about. And we're going to get into this idea of trouble. He's talking about a total different peace because it, it makes complete sense that we would have peace when the absence of trouble. But the Christian, the Christian peace is a peace that doesn't make sense. It surpasses understanding because in the midst of trouble, like my mom and Will back or many of you, in the midst of that, you still have peace. Where does that come from? Where it comes from, he says, by in me, you might have peace. And, and those words that in me, that, that, that by being secured in that. And I, and I think that the in me, there's, there's two, two elements to that. One has to do with our, with our position, right? Of, of when we are, and that's something that's been done for us, that when you become a Christian, uh, when, when you accept Christ and his salvation and you receive that salvation by faith, that your position in life, Scripture tells us, changes. And he actually prays this in, in, the next ver- in the next chapter, in chapter 17. He says, Father, I am, like I am in you, they will be in me, and I will have them. You are secured. And that's something that none of us do on our own accord. So I, some of us just need to hear that, that we don't get into Christ by our own actions, and we don't fall out of Christ by our own actions. It's something he secures for us in Jesus and it's that in, in, in the cross and it is that position that then gives us peace. It's, it's, it's something now our recognition of that position I think has a lot to do with, with what he talks about in chapter 15 if, of abiding in me, of being connected to me, of having a relationship with me. Uh, and then you'll recognize, you'll see um, that you are in me, that this is where you are, that is secured by you. But this peace starts not with our actions again, but it's starting with what Jesus has accomplished for us, that I am in you. And so I can wake up in, in the guilt and in the shame of mistakes, and I can turn to Christ and say, like the prodigal son, what do I need to do to get back in you? In, in good graces with you. And he said, you haven't fallen out because Christ secured your position for eternity. And that is a message of astounding grace, right? Yeah, I know. Absolutely. And whenever we hear those words in me, our mind should immediately go back uh, to, to John 15. 15, yeah. 15. Remember, I'm the vine, you are the... Uh, 
What is it? I am the vine, you are the branches. <laughs> branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, uh, you can do nothing. And so one of the questions that was in here goes back to 15. Of, remember the vine dresser comes in and the branches that aren't producing fruit, they're cast into the fire. Those that are producing fruit are, are, are trimmed back, right? They're pruned. And we talked about that combination. Somebody asked, well, if those are, are cast into the fire, it doesn't sound like that's something Jesus would do. And, and there are some translators who think that those that are cast into the fire, the fire then refines them so they can produce fruit. I don't think that's what the text is talking about. I do think it's a literal, we're showing heaven and hell there. There's judgment uh, that is taking place, but others, others may, may translate that a little bit different. But this concept of, of now being in Christ, uh, of abiding in Him, of trusting in Him, of obeying Him, that it's in those things that the byproduct of that now becomes peace. Remember, uh, remember it's this idea of you cannot bear fruit on your own, and if, yet if you remain in me, well, in part, uh, John 16, the end of 16, uh, gives us an evidence of what fruit is. In part, one, one of the fruits uh, of abiding in Christ now is peace. Now, we said that. We said that in the sermon that we did several weeks ago, that, that the fruit of the Spirit uh, of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, uh, and, and self-control, that that's an aspect of what's going on here. And so, in part, in part, if you find yourself in unpeaceful situations, if there is an inner turmoil that is taking place, if you find your, if you feel separated from God, even though you are a follower of Jesus, in part, you can begin to ask, am I trusting in Him? Am I abiding in Him? Because in part, as Shelton said, it is this position that we have, and if you're a believer, you have it no matter what. But there's another aspect of, am I making this decision in Christ, or am I making it in me? Am I believing in me, or am I obeying in Him? If you're obeying in Him, an ultimate byproduct of that should eventually be peace. If I'm trusting in me, then God, in His graciousness, is going to withhold His peace from me so that I don't trust in myself even more, so that I recognize the trouble. In part, in part, the restlessness that some of you have is a sign of God's grace. Because you're trusting in yourself, you're going your own way, you're disobeying Him, and He in His ever-loving kindness is preventing you from experiencing internal peace because He does not want you to think, to mistakenly believe that you are your only hope. He wants to now call you back and let you experience some turmoil to call you into the hope that is actually there. So He said, uh, I've said these things that in me you might have peace, but then He contrasts it. So in me you might have peace, but He says in the world you're going to have trouble. Tribulation, the text says. I, I, I like it where it says trouble. It's easier to me. So, Shelton, what comes to mind there whenever you see that word tribulation? What's the concept? I, the words before it, you will have trouble. Yeah. I mean, there, there is not a you might have trouble. It's a you will have trouble. This is coming your way. And that, that flies in the face of bad theology that is pretty prevalent right now in Christianity that says that, listen, if, I, if, I accept, if you accept Christ and, and you are a, a, a in Christ, then, then he's going to remove trouble from you. You're going to be wealthy. You're going to be healthy. You're going to have all these things. It's going to be great for you. And that flies right in the face of what he's saying. He said, no, no, no. no. Not if you're a, a good Christian, you won't have trouble. But if you don't have enough faith, then you're going to have trouble. No, no, no. He says, you will have trouble even even the Son of God himself, in an hour from speaking these words, will be arrested and trouble is coming his way. And so the reality is there will be a day when, when we are removed from this side of heaven, we're removed from the fallenness of this world and we're in heaven and, and there is no trouble. But as long as we're on this side, we're in the cursed place where even the Son of God, who God adores... Even he endured trouble, and so we will have trouble. It's a, it's a guarantee, and I think that's something that, that we need to, as Christians, just realize that it's coming. It, it does come. It's the natural byproduct of living on this side of, of heaven. Now, I, I loved what you did during the first service and, and, and walked through the five troubles that... that what, do you remember all five yeah. of them? We'll see. Uh, <laughs> that's why I don't use outlines. Uh, I mean, one, one aspect there is notice what, let's, let's make sure we get what the text says there, what Shelton was hitting on. Notice what the text says and what it doesn't say. It says, in the world you will have trouble. You will have tribulation. It doesn't say, if you don't have faith, yeah. in the world you will have tribulation. In the world you have tribulation if you don't believe in me enough. Now, now you, will, you will turn on the television and, and get a health and wealth preacher that will begin to say that. That if you, don't give me enough, if you don't give me enough money in this world, you're going to have trouble. It's just a lie, right? It doesn't work that way. The text says you will have trouble. And then you can, you can almost, from an application standpoint, you can replace the word world with every aspect of your life. In your marriage, you will have trouble. In your parenting, you will have trouble. 
At work, you will have trouble. In your relationships, every single one of them, you will have trouble. And, and so one thing that that should do for us is should relax us. That whenever <laughs> trouble comes, we, we, should, we should know that that shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't shock us. Oh, yeah, he told us that this would happen. And now there's a path and a plan by which we can look at it. Whenever I think about the word tribulation here, trouble, uh, I, I just begin to think, what are the troubles that Jesus had? What are the struggles that he had? Well, in part, he had trouble with the, with the Pharisees, with the religious crowd, right? And so you and I can expect that if we're living out the gospel, we're going to have trouble with the religious crowd. In part, he, he, he experienced trouble with the secular crowd. So if we're truly preaching the gospel, we're going to irritate both sides of the coin. We're going we're gonna to preach the gospel, and, and the secularist is going to say, you're so judgmental by saying that there is a right and wrong, by saying that some are going to heaven and some are going to hell. But then the religious crowd is going to condemn us by saying, you're too grace-filled. It can't be that easy. And so you're going to experience trouble on, on, on both sides of, of, of those things. And then he experienced the, the trouble and just the struggles of, of living in a fallen world. He, he was completely holy and, and just, but he, but he lived in, in, this, in, in this fallen world, and one of the aspects of that is there were fallen people. And so kind of the third element of trouble that he experienced was, was Judas, absolute betrayal. That he, he, he literally, from our perspective, not from Jesus' perspective, but from our perspective, whenever we experience a Judas-type betrayal, literally somebody is going to appear one way and they're going to be totally different. Their entire heart is going to be evil. Jesus could perceive that. We can't. But in this world, we are going to face that type of trouble. And so he faced it from the religious crowd. He, he faced it from the secular crowd. He had a Judas type of trouble. But then he had a disciple type of trouble. And this was, their hearts were in it, but they were frail human beings. They would fail him in dramatic ways. And, and yet Jesus would still go about in relationship with him. And so in the midst of your relationship, some people are going to be total hypocrites and not be who they appear to be, and you're going to have trouble with them. Others are going to love Jesus and going to love you and then fail you in dramatic ways. And you can guarantee that in this world you're going to have that. Those were four types of trouble that Jesus faced very clearly. But there's a fifth type of trouble that we face that he didn't face. And that fifth type of trouble is ourselves. That that our own broken decision-making, our own poor decision-making, our own ways that we're going to fail others. We're going to experience the consequences of that. Now, Jesus didn't have to experience that because he was perfect. Now, ultimately on the cross, he he felt like what that was like. But whenever I think about trouble, you're going to experience at least those five types of trouble. And whenever they come your way, don't be surprised. They're they're guaranteed that that these are going to be an aspect. You you can't bypass it. Now, that fifth type of trouble, we have some control over. We, We don't the first four. We don't control others. We don't control the religious crowd, the secular crowd. We don't control the Judas-type characters in our lives. We don't trouble, uh, control the disciples in our lives. We do control ourselves. And, and one thing that this passage should call out of us, it's something we studied long ago in Ruth chapter 2 years ago, that when life falls apart, don't make, it, don't make it harder. Life is hard enough. Don't make it harder. You're going to experience enough trouble in this world. Don't experience more. Don't invent trouble. Well, where, where would I turn with a uh, student pastor other than to a student pastor talk about inventing trouble, right? <laughs> I've done a little bit of that in my time. Um, yeah, and, and that's, that's what I run to. Because to an extent, um, listen, Christian, we should have less trouble than the non-believing world. Not because we're better, but because the Spirit of God is leading us to better decision-making, right? And, and by His grace, He is guiding us. Left to my own accord, I will go down paths. I don't need to be down, and I will create trouble. So because I am called and redeemed, and, I, and, and, and He is in my life with His grace, and He is calling, that fifth trouble should be mitigated, right? Like, it should, it should be uh, reducing in my life. Now, there are other troubles. I can't control the diagnosis. I can't control all those things. Uh, the friends, I can't, but I can't control that. And I think back to the moment that, I re- that really kind of dawned on me, uh, my senior year of high school, senioritis set in for me like fall that year. Um, and, uh, and I had an event on a Friday night. My single mom had just bought a new car. Um, and and she, I talked her into letting me drive it to, to school that day. And I had an event that night I had to be at at the stadium at like 5 o'clock. And uh, so we get out of school, and I'd ask my mom, Mom, can I go hang out with a certain group of friends after school? And she said no, because she knew what that certain group of friends did. <laughs> and she said, you don't need to be hanging out with them. You need to be ready. And so I ignore my mom, uh, which is like mistake number one. Uh, and and I went with those friends. And I hid it from her, and I'm, I'm out with these friends and, and horrible decision-making. And, and then... 
uh, I look at my clock and it's like 4.45 and I've got to be back at the stadium at 5 and I'm way far away. So I jump in her new car and, and flying down the road and I take a turn too hard and I hit a patch of loose gravel and the whole car begins spinning and we slam into this embankment. I go up on two wheels and I, I come back down and just that sitting in shock of, oh my gosh. And so I get out of the car and I turn around and the whole side of the car is scraped up. The tires are pulled off the rims and now I've got to call my mom. And, and have this conversation There's like with eight him. elements of the story I've never experienced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe you and all of that. <laughs> but I remember the next week I, I played basketball with these group of, of older guys in our church. It was kind of a neat discipleship thing they did with teenagers. And I remember sitting and I'm pouting because I'm grounded for like the rest of my senior year. Um, it's what every senior wants. Uh, and, and I remember looking at one of those older guys and saying, man, I don't know why this stuff always happens to me. <laughs> as though it was some outside force causing that. And he just looked at me like I was the biggest dummy, which I was in that. And he said, I know exactly why that happened to you because you're doing what you shouldn't have been doing. And it was really the first time it dawned on me, you know what, if I was doing what I should have been doing, I would never have been in that scenario in the first place. And yet I had jumped so far into this, this you know, victim mentality of God is doing this to me, all right? And go, no. I, I was being an idiot. And so sometimes the result of that and so oftentimes is you end up on the ditches of life. And I think to, to how many times in our life, how many struggles in our life do we end up in the ditches of life that we caused? And yet what's fascinating about this passage is that Christ doesn't differentiate from that. He says, hey, trouble will come. And he fully knows that a lot of times that trouble will be your own darn, darn fault. Like you, you yeah. caused that. But take heart. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's a key thing. Think about, think about part of the trouble that he's telling his disciples. They're about to experience trouble uh, because the religious and secular crowd are actually going to gang up on Jesus and they're going to be associated with Jesus. But part of the trouble that they're about to experience, part of the, especially the internal trouble that they're going to experience over the next few days uh, is their own failure. And, and doesn't this amaze you about Jesus? He, he says, hey, you're about to fail me, and I tell you that so that eventually you can have peace. And part of the trouble you're about to experience, you're going you're gonna to inflict on yourself, but, but, but I've overcome the world. In, in the exact same way that he tells Peter in, in 14 and that you're going to deny me, and in 15, he tells him, at the beginning of 14, he tells him not to lose heart. He comes back right here. The, the way that we look at our own sin, in no way should we minimize it. God is holy and just, and it is wrong and treasonous against God. And that is 100% true. And at the same time, God 100% loves us. And somehow those two things wed together, whereas in our own minds, we don't think that. And, and so here, here comes the action step. So the why is uh, that God has overcome the world. The, the, the byproduct of, of us doing this is that we're going that, that to have this peace as we abide uh, in Christ. But how do we do these things? Here comes the command. Take heart. Let's take heart. How, how do we do that? How do we take heart? I, I, I love the idea of take, making that very literal of take your heart and walk it to what you know to be true. Because what happens immediately when, when, the, when struggles come, trouble, when you wake up in the ditch of, I caused this, I'm an idiot, or when you wake up and it's, in the, in the, in the, it's a diagnosis, it's a failed marriage, it's a broken relationship, it's a job loss, whatever the trouble is, and you're sitting in the midst of that, the immediate thing that, that because we're fallen people that we want to do, we run, and, 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 and maybe me more so than you, I run to the struggle of faith, the crisis of faith, going, wait a second, I thought I have a loving God, a powerful God, and, and he's on my side. If all of those things are true, then why do I have trouble? And I start looking back going, is he not loving? Is he not powerful? Is he not on my side? You know, what is the reason that I'm over here in the middle of trouble? And so I begin struggling with that. And, but all of those things are not true. He is still loving. He is still powerful. He is still good. My issue is my heart, because of trouble, has, has run off. I, I use the analogy in, in, in the first service that, that uh, I love taking teenagers down to Haiti. They all, they all want to sleep in, they have these Eno hammocks, backpacking hammocks, and they all want to sleep in their hammocks. And so they'll, they'll bring them and to, to do, you got to find something secure to attach those hammocks to so you can rest down in it. And I think the same is true for our heart. All of us are longing for rest for, and peace for that, and this is what this is promising. And when we don't feel it, we question whether the things, you know, are these not secure anymore? And the problem is, no, 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 they're still secure. You have stopped being attached to it. So go back 
Take your heart like a little child. Walk like the psalmist saying, why are you so downcast within me, O oh my soul? Let me walk you back down to what I know is true. God is good. God is powerful. In Christ, I know that he loves me. Heart secure to that. Now rest down in that. I think there is a spiritual discipline of doing what you know is, is, is true and, yeah. and going back to yeah. it. Yeah, well, and I, I have a similar, it's a, it just expresses, my sinfulness expresses itself <laughs> in a different way. And, and so you might have this crisis of faith of why did this happen? I have this, well, I'll, be, I'll handle it. Yeah. I'll take care of this. So I don't depend on Christ in any way. And, and I think to myself, whenever I think about take heart here, what I'm reminded of is, is, is what God has already done for us. Take heart, meaning we can rest in this truth that He has overcome the world. Take heart in who have I proven myself to be. Whenever I lose heart, and in part I think that's the encouragement here, He's commanding us to take heart in part because He knows he's gonna, they're going to lose heart. He knows we're going to lose heart. Our, 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 our feeling of Christ being with us is going to wax and wane, and that's just, just a part of relationship. And so he understands, whenever you experience those times, the, the most faithful and the most faithless are going to experience those times. Whenever you experience those times, now here's what you do. You take heart. And one of the things that, that where my mind immediately goes is I tend to lose heart whenever I lose a vision of who God is. Whenever I forget that he is sovereign and loving, both of those things, that he is sovereign, which means he controls all things. Nothing happens without at least his divine permission. And he is loving, which means everything that he allows in my life, he will ultimately use for my good. Whenever I have those two concepts in mind, I have heart. I trust him. I believe him. But whenever I begin to lose a picture of either of those two things, I begin to lose my heart. I wonder, imagine if we had a little thing of Play-Doh, a little personal thing of Play-Doh, right? And you pour that out, and imagine that big glump now symbolizes your heart. And the world begins to attack it. And slowly, people just begin to, to piece some of it away. And, and so there's betrayal in, in a relationship, and there's failure of some sort, and you lose some of it, and your, your heart gets basically spread out all over the place. How broken is your heart at this moment? What Jesus is saying is, because of His sovereign love for us, because of the power that He has shown now, literally, we have the ability, through the power of His Holy Spirit, to bring our heart back together and to give it to Him and to trust Him in everything that's going on to where we can be fully alive in much the same way that we talked about two weeks ago. Despite all the chaos going on around us, we can kind of be in the eye of the storm. There can be this peace that we have in the midst of the chaos. Max Lucado wrote a book years ago called In the Eye of the Storm. It's that concept that, that we can have a trust even when the winds of doubt are whipping all around us. We can have this faith even when everybody around us is insecure. We can have this hope even when the circumstances seem completely hopeless. And all of that here, it seems as though Jesus is saying, this is, this is on the table for you. You can have it if, if you want it. But in order to get it, you're gonna, now going to have to abide in me. You're going to have to trust me and follow me. Well, well, Shelton, this is normally when I start preaching, but you conclude here, so let's, <laughs> let's wrap this up. Let's, um, let's, let's just kind of step out of this verse and say, all right, here's the verse of what's going on, and here's how, here's how I like to conclude sermons is, is what in this verse now makes you love Jesus even more today? You know, I think for me right now, we're in a good place. I'm not sitting in the middle of trouble. But I know there will be days. I know, I know those seasons come because they even came to Christ and this idea. And, and, and yet, and so, if the, and a lot of you that might be, some of you might be sitting in a season of trouble. Others of you might be in a, in a good place right now. But to me, this is a takeaway verse that I walk away and it says, I've told you these things. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. The beauty of that statement of sitting there, of there is no doubt in Christ's mind. He says, I have overcome it. It's done. It's completed. It's like you said, it's already on the table. If you don't have peace, it's not because I haven't provided. It's not because I'm not strong. It's not because I haven't overcome. It's because you're not resting in what I've already done. And so in a moment right now where I have peace, uh, for me, it is I need to be in this place, maybe even more so in a good moment, uh, because I need to continue to remind my heart because there will be seasons when trouble hits. And what oftentimes happens to us as Christians are we're good, we're fine, we don't have that need. And so we begin to drift away. Summer's coming, vacations come, we get out of that habit and you begin to drift away from the reminder of, of that he's strong, he loves us. And then that's when the hard season hits, right? And then all of a sudden we begin in that storm and not feeling that peace. And so right now for me personally, 
The takeaway is I need to celebrate this as much as possible. I love Jesus because he has overcome the world. And no matter what the world throws my way, that will always be true. Yeah. And he has me. And yeah. so. Good. You know why I love Jesus? Why, why Kevin? Tell me. Have you ever heard before? <laughs> you know why I love Jesus today? About a year ago, we decided to study the book of John. We begin to lay out. It's going to take us about 60 weeks or so. And so right around Easter time, we're going to kind of be right about here, which it wasn't finely tuned plan, but it was pretty close that today we'd be right here. Which means for many of you, long before your trouble ever began, he was already at work. And he allowed you to be here today. And I don't, I don't fully know why, but there's a thousand different circumstances that have, could have kept you from this place today. And Yet here you are with the troubles that you have, and, and, and the troubles are so varied, so different. There are some in this room that are suffering tremendous troubles because of their own poor decision-making, and the consequences of those are, are being played out uh, in their lives. There are others who, just because of the fallenness of this world, the ugliness that is there, you're, you're suffering today. There are some in fear of, of what the diagnosis might hold this week, or what the test uh, might reveal, or what might happen to your loved one, or the relationship, or the, the employment that you have. There are others who are suffering in tremendous ways for no other other reason than the poor choices of other people. And you walk into the room today and the text starts talking about how you can have peace, how you can take heart because He's overcome the world. It's a great hope to us today. I think of everywhere we've been in John's gospel, He's been giving you the answer, how can I have peace? It's because of who God is. It's because of what He's done. He truly is the light of the world. He is the one who invaded, that came down from heaven, and because of the love, He invaded this world. He is the, the one who just on a whim can change water into wine. He's the one that has so powerful that He doesn't have to be in the situation, but from a distance, He can heal the ruler's son. He's the one that has such a power and such a compassion. He can see the lame man that everybody else is walking by and cause him to rise up and walk. He's the one when everybody see, thinks that he's nowhere to be found. Suddenly he's walking along beside you on the water. He's the one so powerful. He can take the smallest of resources and take a little sack lunch and feed the 5,000. He's the one that literally can raise Lazarus from the dead. And In the midst of showing the power of who he is, he's come alongside of us during this study and he has said, I am the light of the world. I'm the bread of life if you're hungry today. Are you confused? You, you don't know where to go? He is the way, the truth, and the life. You don't know which door to choose? He is the door. You feel all dead inside? He is the resurrection and the life. You feel all alone? He is the vine that you can connect with. Which means whatever trouble you are facing today, whatever situation or circumstance you are in, if you're in the most peaceful place you've been in a long time, or if your world is turned upside down, he is the great I am. And to the extent that you and I recognize the power of who He is and the love that He has for us, we will have peace. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me?